Welcome to Electric Tea Time with Veronica and Don. Cheers. Cheers. In Electric Tea Time, we are exploring the latest trends in battery technology, electric vehicles, and renewable energy. We both work in the industry. We live this electric lifestyle here in the Midwest, and we are super passionate to share our experience. Today, we're talking about the electrification of large machines. What does the battery for an all-electric excavator look like? What makes it especially durable and long-lasting? And what does Arnold Schwarzenegger have to do with that? So in the beginning of the year, we both went to CES and one of the highlights that we saw there was the John Deere booth. So for me, it was really the first time that I saw such a huge machine running on battery power only. It's really interesting. The mining application for electric vehicles uh, is, is becoming a hot topic. So what we see is, you know, even in these big mines, you have the mining trucks at the top of the mine and the battery is, let's say, empty. And then when they're driving down into the mine, they're regenning the entire time and charging up the battery while they drive down. They top off the charge down at the bottom while they're getting loaded up, and then they drive electric out of the mine. And this really drastically reduces the local emissions inside of the mine. But in this case, we saw an electric excavator. Yes, and you could really go in there. They had a little demonstration how much more quiet the electric version is as compared to diesel. You could see the battery, you could see where it's located. Of course, this excavator was only a prototype, so it's not for sale yet, but it was really cool to see it at the show. But there was actually a commercial product, which is the battery by a company called Chrysal. And this company is located in beautiful Austria. So one of the interesting things, of course, is that John Deere does own a majority stake in Chrysal battery. And so this is why they're co-displaying it at CES. So let's talk a little bit about the battery. So it's a 400 volt battery pack. It consists of cylindrical cells, 21700, and they told us that that version has NMC chemistry. So how big was the battery? So one of those packs was 63 kilowatt hours, but you could take those packs and then either put them in series or parallel and then have a 400 volts or 800 volt system. So that's a super flexible setup. And what was really cool is that you can stack those modules either like horizontally or vertically, which is really makes it very modular. Yeah, we talked about different configurations for the battery for the Jeep like this, whether we wanted to mount them vertically or horizontally next to each other. Uh, but we weren't exactly sure with the pouch cells uh, what was the best way. So we're going to mount them as they were built into the Mustang Mach-E. For me, the most exciting part of that battery is not the fact that it has cylindrical cells or the cell chemistry itself, but it's more about the thermal management. The cells are immersion cooled. They're basically taking a bath in a fluid. After trying to design our own battery packs, I can really appreciate the packaging challenges that all of these companies are facing. And this immersion cooling technology is really cool. No pun intended. <laughs> As we all know, batteries have this comfortable temperature window, right? They don't want to be too hot. They don't want to be too cold. So over Sounds like somebody I know. <laughs> exactly. Just like a human being. <laughs> so you have to uh, warm them up when it's freezing outside and cool them down when you are doing fast charging or when it's just too hot for them. In passenger cars, I would say the most common way that we see people doing that today is with an active liquid cooling system where you have a fluid running through a cooling plate and then you have kind of the cells on top of this plate or for the Tesla, for example, where you have the tubes and the coolant is flowing through the tubes and then you have a certain contact area to the cells. Another way that is not very common anymore is air cooled systems. The Nissan Leaf was well known for the air-cooled systems in the beginning, but we can already see that the batteries have been degrading over the years and there's a lot of people that want to replace their older batteries with new water-cooled Leaf batteries because they have a much longer life. Yeah, so liquid cooling is pretty much state-of-the-art for passenger cars. Now for higher power applications like, for example, this excavator, you need even more efficient cooling. And a way to do that is to have the battery cells really flooded by a coolant. For example, I think we've all come home late from work and realized we forgot to thaw out the steaks for dinner. And then the fastest way to do that is you take the frozen steak in a bag and you put it in the 
bowl of water and it thaws out much faster. So the transfer properties of the heat into the liquid is much faster than if you try to do it through a metal plate. Thank you so much for that analogy. You're welcome. Cool. And Chrysler actually has a patent for that technology. You can see that each cylindrical cell is surrounded by what they call a hollow block. It looks like plastic and this is where the fluid is captured. Honestly, it's really amazing to me that the system doesn't leak. Usually these batteries, these immersion cooled batteries are using dielectric uh, liquids. So even if they do leak inside of the battery pack, uh, you don't have the short circuit potential that you would have as if you had a traditional water glycol cooling fluid. So again, the battery is actually a commercial product. And if you go to their website, you can really see how they proved out how much more performance this battery has and lifetime and better charging and safety of this battery as compared to the conventional cooling. So you mentioned Arnold Schwarzenegger in the beginning. What does he have to do with this? <laughs> The funny thing is, and I actually didn't know that before I did some research, is that Arnold Schwarzenegger used the Chrysler company and their batteries for his conversions. Did Arnold actually do the conversion himself? Well, I don't think so. I guess he hired Chrysler to do that. and But I think he did it on two cars, like a Mercedes and the Hummer. Oh, very cool. So just like Jerry and everything, he also converted a Hummer. Yes, and maybe I need to mention right now that I grew up just 20 minutes apart from Arnold Schwarzenegger, just a little bit later in time. You can actually visit his house. Yes, I, I've done this a few times uh, with my family it? visited. Yeah, it's very cool. They turned it into a museum. The Terminator. <laughs> I'll be back. I'll be back. We'll be back. So what kind of tea are you drinking? I am drinking a really, really special tea here. It's a flowering tea, look. You can have this little flower in there and it looks really cool. Wow, that's and very it's nice. It's actually pretty good. Oh. Wow. Which tea do you have? Uh, I have black tea from Costco. Oh, awesome. <laughs> I think what we didn't touch on so much is like, what is the real application of electric machines like that? How does a typical workday look like? What are the different applications? And, you know, if we think about battery powered and charging time, so how would that actually work? I guess I can imagine, you know, being at a job site during the day, maybe there's a large energy storage system that's on a truck or something, and then the excavators, any of the power tools, all of the equipment that's being used on the job site can be used with, of course, their own small batteries, but then on breaks and stuff like this, you can maybe fast charge from the bigger battery. Um, and then at the night, you can then take that larger battery energy storage system and take it to a charging station. Maybe you can swap it out with another one that's been charging from the sun all day long. So I guess very good applications for electric machines like that could be like indoor projects and like underground mining where really the pollution is the problem right now. And you know, John Deere is not the only company that is looking into the electrification of heavy machinery. There is also Caterpillar, for example, that I think for a while it looked like they would only do hydrogen or focus on hydrogen, but they also announced some some battery powered machinery. So it's just very exciting field. And now for some EV news, we turn it over to our news team. Welcome to EV News Flash. Ford and CATL made a big announcement that they are opening up a battery manufacturing facility in Southeast Michigan to produce LFP battery cells for Ford's current and upcoming EVs. It's a $3.5 billion factory that should create more than 2,500 jobs and should begin production in 2026. That's a big shift to a local supply chain for Ford here in the U.S. Volta Foundation has released their latest battery report. This is an incredible report for everyone in the EV battery industry, containing a tremendous amount of data from 2022 about industry and market trends, research and results. And it's free. Please check it out with the link below. For one of the other original big three, GM has announced their shift from pouch cells to cylindrical cells. Of course, you all know that companies like Tesla, Lucid or Rivian are using cylindrical cells in their packs from the very beginning. But now we're seeing legacy automakers like GM and BMW investigating this form factor. This could be very exciting for Second Life and other standardization topics. Hopefully they're working together on this. Or we can all go to a honeycomb battery like BYD's new battery. <laughs> 
so now for the last thing for today, we want to give you an update for our personal project. What do we want to share? Let's talk about the solar. Okay. Our solar company is bankrupt. <laughs> yeah, this is unfortunate. They, uh, we got the message last week that the solar company we chose has gone out of business. Luckily for us, we have our installation complete. There's a lot of other people in Wisconsin who put the deposit down and don't have any solar panels. So at least we got that. Yeah, they completely shut down the, the communication. You can't reach anybody anymore. I mean, it's horrible. Yeah. But yeah, we're lucky. So our installation process took like six months and it was finished in October, October I think. Yeah, and since then it's basically running pretty well. There's a few things that they were supposed to address just to finalize it, but of course that's not gonna happen now. And I think the more frustrating thing was is part of the contract was this service contract with a third party company that was gonna monitor the solar panels and then tell us the, you know, if there was anything wrong. And we got a letter from them saying, we have not gotten paid from Sun Badger. Your contract is canceled. Don't call us, uh, good luck. But I mean, apart from that, the installation process was really good. The, the system works really well. And I guess we will do like a detailed video about what you can expect when you get solar. And then really once we have several months of data, we wanna show you how it performs and how it affects our electricity bill, how much we consume and how that all works with also we energy here yes. in Wisconsin. So, and then of course, everybody asks about the Jeep. So we had a great successful trip to SEMA where we showed off the first prototype. So it wasn't a completely running Jeep yet, but we had everything kind of in place. Um, since then, uh, progress has been slower than we <laughs> wanted it, but we're still working on it. We still want to get it up and running. So we'll have a bit more uh, coverage on that a little bit later. And with that, we want to thank you for watching. I hope you enjoyed this very first episode of Electric Tea Time with Veronica and Dawn. Please come back. Bye. Cheers. <laughs> Do you want to try that again?